my role in the family from that, from once I left home and got out on my own and established myself, like they don't deal that much with the outside world. So like if they needed to somebody to talk to an attorney, and I'm talking about my family specifically, mm -hmm. like if mom needed a consult or whatever, she would have me go with her and I would, you know, not interpret, but make sure that she understood, her and dad understood everything. And um, and my dad was savvy. My, my dad, I'm telling you, I don't know why he was in the cult. I, I honestly don't. My dad was probably one of the coolest dudes I ever knew. When did he join? Do you know? He was a kid. So his family came, went out to California. And this is my thought in looking back on some of the history. And then I've talked to some people in researching the last year. Um, when they moved to Bakersfield, California, they didn't know anyone. And they, I think a lot of times in those early, early years, people like my parents and their parents, my grandparents, who I never knew, were seeking community. And they were seeking a place where they could, you know, so you move with your family to a strange state and you don't know anyone and you believe in God, but you're not Catholic and you're not any of that. And they would hold gospel meetings. And they, back then, I don't know if they do that anymore, but back then they used to um, uh, go around and, you know, try to talk to people sort of like the Mormons mm -hmm. and get people to come to gospel meeting. And so, um that was their number. That was how they racked up numbers that and having children, so, you know, the more kids you correct me if I'm wrong, I guess the point at which this really becomes a cult, you know, cause uh, a lot of this is, is definitely strange, but I think the, where they crossed the line, even, you know, putting all the uh, depraved stuff we'll get into later uh, to the side is that I, I think they kind of downplay the role of Christ to some degree like or like the love of god seems more conditional in the cult so you're you don't know if you're being saved until the point of death correct well yes so like for me um i had to profess as i as i came up through the ranks and i got to a certain age i had to stand up in a gospel meeting and say admit that i you know accepted christ and that made me officially in but then you're not officially, officially in until you're baptized. Once you're baptized, if you live your life correctly, you get to go to heaven. You're the chosen. Like the only people going to heaven are people in the truth. That's it. I don't care what religion you are. You're not going. If, and that just like never made sense to me. Hmm. So everybody else is wrong. <laughs> That's you know, why it I seems mean, like it's a, a hard thing to escape. Because if you're born into this mm -hmm. and you're told this is the only salvation you have, from what I'm hearing from various people who've left is that, yeah, it's hard to leave because we've been told our whole lives this is the only way to heaven. Which is a very curious cat, which actually brings me to how old were you? Did you say how old you were when you left? Like, how was it more recent or? I was 16. How so old? when I was 17. 17. When I was 13, a uh, 27 year old in our meeting uh, took a shine to me. 27. Hmm. I can tell you today, if a 27-year-old sniffed around my 13-year-old daughter, mm -mm. they might get a bullet. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But that was this whole, Tammy's got a wild streak because she asked too many questions. Tammy's rebellious. Right. And this is the way it was presented to me was, you know, my dad disagreed. My mom, in that instance, overrode him uh, because maybe that'll keep her in the truth because we don't want her to leave. So, you know, if we let this relationship happen, the, and I look back on that and I think I was 13 years old. That man knows what he did. My right. family knows what he did and never stuck up for me, not once. And then after, uh, I think I was 16, so it, it went on for a while. Uh, we, the convention was coming up and that was gonna be our first walk together where the world knew. And he had gone to Scottsdale, Arizona convention the week before. And he came, convention starts on Wednesday night and runs through Sunday. He called and said he needed to see me. And he, he came to our house and um, dumped me. And mm -hmm. he had met a tall blonde named Tammy in Scottsdale. What? That had money. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Connection. Whoa. So, Weird. Then you know, fast forward like thirty years, and I've been like, like I I can't 
get enough degrees. I can't prove myself enough. You know, I mean, it had such a lasting impact on me. Right. If I get another degree, if I just make more money, they'll love me. Right. Maybe you were saved. <laughs> from when you left, though, did you have a relationship with your with your parents? Not for a while. Not for a while. I was cut off. And, and my relationship with my siblings today is very much the same way. And not just my siblings, my cousins. Uh, you know what my big sin is with them right now? Like they, they don't even talk to me is that I asked them for help when we went homeless. Mm. That's my big sin. Like what do you, I, it's insanity to me. Like, what, isn't that what family is for? Right. And, right. and believe me, I've helped every single family member. So there's these weird things because I stepped outside what I'm supposed to. And I said things I wasn't supposed to about the church. So you're like, and it's interesting because I've talked to quite a few of the um, girls I know from Albuquerque when this story hit and the FBI started calling. I, I, my thing was like, okay, are you guys ready to like say something now? Hmm. Are you ready to step up? This is legit. This is real. This isn't just us complaining that we were sexually abused and treated, you know, I mean, we were mentally abused i wouldn't say physically because you know we didn't get hit or beat or anything like that but if every day it's never good enough it's always your fault i can't even explain how hard on the girls the mothers are mm -hmm. they're so cold and and if a man leaves you you did something wrong mm -hmm. it's you you know you, you need to change and that has such a lasting impact and the sad thing is, is some of the girls that I grew up with, um, we've talked since throughout the years. And we all said if we had known that each other was feeling the same way, we might could have banded together and helped each other. But we were so isolated amongst our own family that and you just didn't talk. We didn't go to counseling. You know, when when Chuck dumped me, um, by the way, that was the first time I saw something with my brother that was cruel. Hmm. So my brother and I were like 10 months apart and um, we look like twins and he was my best friend. I cannot explain to you how much I loved him and what a deep, deep, it, the bond was so bad and so thick that this is like my mother when she thought I was, you know, heading off to bed. She would use my brother to guilt trip me. Right. She would say to me, like, if you don't straighten up, I'm afraid something's going to happen to your brother because, you know, sometimes God takes away the thing you love the most. So I lived in fear that something was going to happen to my brother. Right. And then I would see my brother do all this shady stuff. Like I would say to all the men and everybody who's who's watching us and talking about us, oh, they're crazy, they're on drugs, they're this, they're that. When's the last time they looked at porn? Yep. So much hypocrisy. Yep. That's what I it seems. At, right. That's what it seems. A lot, and it's not just unique to the two by twos. This hypocrisy yeah. exists in any organization, especially in the ones that seem to profess being so pure and the way, the yeah. one true way. There's all, yeah. look at politics, you know, it's, it's literally everywhere. Uh, so your, your brother is 10 months older than you. And I think you were telling me, or is it 10 months older or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's about 10 months older than me. His name was Carlin. And so he was very shy. He got my mother's personality. And it always was a rub for him. Like we used to joke about it growing up because he wanted to be like my dad. Mm -hmm. And I was a carbon copy, spitting image. You know, I didn't take guff off of anybody. And, and Carlin was just painfully shy. So he was kind of my mom's you know, pet. not I, I don't want to say pet because I was very loved by my parents. They just clearly... Carlin was the one who, in their eyes, did everything right. Mm -hmm. But behind the scenes, not so much. Right. Like, I knew where he drank. I knew what women he liked. And none of that did I care about except when you're coming for me. And I, I you know, would never rat him out ever in a million years. Here's a, here's a like funny example. Like, we went, my mom and dad were out of town, and we went to the baseball game. I think it was a Lobo game or football game big thing in Albuquerque Lobos or the hobos, as I like to say. And uh, we get back and mom and dad, my mom was a little, little detective and she was always trying to bust me and she couldn't break me. And so 
they they call Carla in and they're like, you know, we talked to your sister and we know everything. You want to tell us what you did this weekend? And he seems like a canary, right? So now they have the deeds and then they call the tamster in. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't go to the game. And like, they couldn't bring me. My dad would get so mad. He's like, Carlin said, and I'm like, I don't, he might've gone with somebody, but it wasn't me. That was the like stark difference between us. Like Carlin was easily broken. Mom saw it as easily sweet Mm -hmm. and very, um, very much um, a child of God. Right. Whereas I had a rebellious heart and Carlin was soft and wanted to please God. And I was always questioning. And, and I was, yeah. I was like, I don't think he wants me to get beat up every day. Right. When, when uh, you snuck out, were you changing out of that attire you were supposed to be in? Or are you still going out? Oh, well, let me tell you what sister used to do. Okay. Not with my brother, but I used to go out. And this, you know, this is what happens when you have like this kind of, iron will on you all the time. So in my room, I had a a window and this was when I was older. This is when I was in my teens. I would wait for my mom and dad to go to bed. And then I would get up and I would leave my door open about yay big. And I would put a lump in my bed and I would take a light colored sleeve and put it up there. And then something light on the, on the pillow that looked like blonde hair. Mm -hmm. So if dad moves down the hallway and looked in, it would look like I was in there. And then I would slip out my window and we never did anything. We were just dumb kids. Mm-hmm. My friend would pick me up around the corner and we would go to Eastdale and go cruising. Right. And, you know, that, that was in one day um, we took off and it didn't feel right. That was actually that night was the first time I felt the feeling that I learned to, to acknowledge. Um, I, I today kind of, and honing it in to be the gift of discernment. Mm-hmm. I knew that night something was off. I could feel it. Right. And I told her, you need to take me home. And so she dropped me off and I walked up and, and um, like the lights are all out. And I'm like, well, they can't know because, the, you know, the fucking lights would be on and right. it'd be like the preachers would be waiting on the front porch for me. And so I stealthy go up and I open my window and I look, my lump is there and I'm like, silent as a mouse up over into the room and my mother sits up in the bed (laughs) but that's like even even my mom it was like always you know there was always and so i would hide clothes and i would squirrel away money and try to get like a pantsuit as we called it back then anything that wasn't the amish dress right and um, absolutely i did not want to look like i looked i didn't want to be you know, in that, yeah. So you going back to when you said Chuck broke up with you, that was the first time you saw something bad in your brother. What was that? So Carmen and I went to the same high school and I, I would later categorize him as weak. I saw him lacking courage. So I got bullied and picked on and that was, um, I graduated in 78. So and a couple of years prior to that, they decided that they wanted to bus us uh, down to a different district. So there was more white kids in this district. Mm-hmm. And so they took us out of the district that we were in and shipped us down to Highland High School, which was predominantly Hispanic. And, um, you know, the bullying really ramped up then. Like they, the girls, the Hispanic girls said that they were going to get the wet eyes and shave their heads. And they put a couple of them in the hospital with razor wow. cuts and stuff. And it, it was a, it was a rough school. It was not a fun time. And uh, they kind of left me alone because they decided I was loco because I was just at that point really angry. And I was like, bring it. And it was the only defense I had, you know, I just, um, it was like, you know, it's going to hurt anyway. Like I used to walk through the jocks every morning to get to my first period class and they would shove me and grab my boobs and say, Oh, you're going to mm. fuck the girl. And she's mm. your girlfriend. Like one time I fell down and my dress was up over my head. I was humiliated on a daily basis. So to know me was to get bullied. So the first day of high school, I remember seeing my brother in the hallway and thinking, Oh, thank God, a familiar face. And then he just made eye contact and walked right by me. And like, I didn't, I I knew immediately I understood like he can't handle it. Right. And so I 
I didn't even like I wasn't even mad. Mm -hmm. It was just like, okay, I understand. So it was little things like that where I saw him in some ways lacking courage. And I didn't identify it then. So Chuck dumps me. This is my brother and I would get out of school and get in his four wheel drive and head to the hills and we would four wheel drive for hours and talk about everything. And we did this every day. We were thick as thieves. He was my best friend. And when Chuck dumped me, I was crushed. Mm -hmm. I was humiliated and I was crushed and probably clinically depressed. Right. And I would go to school every day in my stupid dress and the entire congregation, the guy dumped me and for a solid year until he married the other girl, because they were engaged a year until she was old enough. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Got to wait for those deeds. Uh, he me to our meeting, still in front of my family, the workers, everybody still played footsies with me, still played grab ass. And my wow. stupid little time thought, you know, oh, it's going to be okay. He's going to come back, you know. Right. And, and nobody said a word. Everybody's just watching this whole thing and clucking away, right? Yep. So um, I remember Carlin, I was listening to Waylon Jennings and crying. And he came in my room and he goes, I'm really sick of you crying. And I just looked at him and I'm like, what do you want me to do? And he goes, just stop. Mm. And he didn't speak to me again. Mm. And it hurt my heart so bad and like he was my one person he was my guy he was mm -hmm. the one person that knew me that understood my hurt you know you're so dramatic at that age anyway but then you couple all this weird crap yeah. and you really are out there and i that was the first time i i did a mantra where there was a song on the radio at the time that said big girls don't cry big mm -hmm. girls don't cry and i would just say that over and over and over and I literally shut down my ability to cry. And I don't think I cried for 10 years. And wow. I never spoke to him again. And we never spoke again for many, many years. And I saw that it was cruel. Another thing that happened one time, and I'm not saying that he did this with this outcome in mind. I'm just saying it wasn't a very nice thing to do. And I saw glimpses of that throughout our years. Um, I used to rescue dogs. Well, we didn't call it rescue back then, but if there was a stray dog in the neighborhood, I would find it. <laughs> and in my mind, tame it. They were like the only friends I had. Mm -hmm. and, and I would keep them in the back of the neighbor. The neighbor had the old people. They had a backyard they never went in. And I don't know why, but my brother didn't like that. <laughs> and I had found this one dog. He was like a husky mix. And, uh, you know, I fancied myself like Jack and Call of the Wild. And that was <laughs> Buck, my my wolf dog right, and yeah. <laughs> going out there and sneaking him food and stuff. And, and Carlin ran him off and they threw rocks at him to mm. get him to go. I'll never forget. I didn't rescue another dog for probably 30 years. That mm. dog turned around looking at me like his eyes were imploring me, you know, mm. and I was just going, don't, don't throw rocks at him. And he got hit by a car and killed. Sheesh. Do you, do you think it, your, your brother was doing this, uh, because he wanted to secure a position as an elder in the cult? Not at that point. Not at that point. He was just a soldier. Right. You know, what, <laughs> what I learned later. Um, so, you know, I went on to work in the field of mental illness. Right. And I've had a lot of experiences with, at the time, I wouldn't say demons. Uh, I just saw people change and yeah. it didn't really, you know, it was pretty, I've seen a lot. And, and one of the cases that I had, I had picked up, um, you know, if you ever decide you need to take sleep aids, don't take Ambien. Oh yeah. Heard, heard about that. It's like the devil's drug. We it call it Ambien. Up. Yeah. It's like a portal. Dude. So, so I picked this girl up. I do an intervention, alcoholic, young female. And, um, you know, when somebody's on their way to treatment, you let them drink. You let them do whatever, right? And because one, you don't want them detoxing and going in. Got to get them there, yeah. And so whatever it takes, you know. Mm -hmm. And so she said she needed to go change her clothes, and her parents were like, "Should we go in there?" And I'm like, "No, nah, she's going to go in there and drink. Let her go drink whatever she's got left, and then we'll she'll be more agreeable. We'll go." Right. So she did. She came out. And she was in a little sundress. She changed her dress, and she smelled like vodka. And I was like, "Well done. Let's go." And uh, we get in the front of the car and I had an Audi 
And um, that she's the one that taught me to put them in the back and hit the locks. So she's sitting in in the car and I'm chatting away with her, you know, and making small talk. And after a while, she gets quiet and I'm thinking right on. She passed out. And I kind of look over at her and she's like, first of all, it's the hands. She's got her hands like real sexual. Mm-hmm. And she's kind of doing something with her seatbelt strap mm-hmm. and I'm driving. Right. And I'm like, oh, God, not one of these. Right. <laughs> and then she starts lifting her skirt up and she doesn't have any underwear on. And I'm like, oh, dear God, right. like this is just not acceptable. And. I am not kidding you. I'm right here in the uh, on the left, so I'm her. And all of a sudden, her head just goes, "Mom," and she looks right at me. And every year, her eyes were as black as could be. It was like a demon. Wow. I, I am. I hit. I called my nurse and said, "Abort. Meet me at the hospital. I got an Ambien OD." Wow. There's. Just, it, it was like her eyes were black, and the way she locked in on me. Wow. It like she just almost transformed and freaked me out. Yeah. Like I had to go sage cleansing because I was like, I can't have that energy in my car. And you know, when she was detox, she was fine. But right. that was when I started saying, I wonder if mental illness addiction is the key for the devil. Yeah, you know, and that we can't begin this like uh, really a questioning for me that I didn't speak out loud. Right. It was just something that um, I, I saw so much evil and I wondered like, what, what makes, why are people evil? 